Okay, welcome everyone to um, our, the ACA's Digital Technologies webinar series. Today we'll be covering a topic that I know we've had a lot of interest in. A lot of questions come from many of our, um, our fans and our, our teachers that engage with us on a regular basis. And that topic is how we assess the digital technologies effectively. So today you've got me. My name's Bruce Feuder. I'm a computing education specialist at the ACA and have been teaching for 15 years prior to joining the, uh, the Academy and was one of the writers of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies as well as a digital technologies teacher for years six through 12 over my teaching career um, as, as a classroom teacher, head of faculty, deputy principal. So that's a bit of a very short sort of bio about me. Owen, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Owen. Um, before working at the Computing Academy, I was an electrical engineer, so I worked in different um, uh, physics labs or optics labs, but now I work in um, uh, education. As, I guess I specialize in the embedded systems area and also um, quite uh, confident with uh, the programming side of um, digital technologies as well. And that's basically what we'll be focusing on today. Yeah, so it's great. We've been able to sort of spend a substantial amount of time really thinking carefully about what we want to get out of this assessment webinar. So we really hope this ticks the boxes for you. If uh, you have any questions about anything as we're presenting, feel free to hit us up in the chat and we'll do our best to, to address questions as they come up. Uh, and, you know, there'll be opportunities to engage with us throughout via both um, voice chat, if you wanted to turn your mic on and, and contribute, but do let us know beforehand so we can manage that effectively. And also through some annotation activities that we're going to be doing as well. Yeah, if you do want to ask questions with your microphone, just raise your hand beforehand and I'll, uh, I'll unmute you. Excellent. So agenda today is, it's pretty packed for a one hour session, but we wanted to make sure that we gave you a lot of really practical ideas and we're able to present what we think is a really well put together task. We've got the luxury of not having to manage our day-to-day -day classroom activities while we're designing activities like this. So uh, what we hope is that this provides you with sort of a template, I guess, that you could use to really dive into um, the assessment of digital technologies effectively in your classroom. So it's going to be very hands-on. Um, as a result, like I said, we want your input and we want your contributions through the chat as often as possible. And the goal is to really give you opportunities to apply some of what we're talking about um, when, we, when it comes to assessment through, the, um, through the, uh, the agenda for today as well. So we're going to start off by just giving a sort of very brief rundown of what we aim to get out of a digital technologies assessment. And we're going to do that by looking at a classroom activity that we think is a good indication of the, the types of things you would want to set up as your day-to-day -day class activities at school with your students. We're going to look at how you can use that as a, as a form of ongoing assessment with your students and how you might divide up that assessment over a number of different activities that would sort of create a portfolio of work that the students will complete over the course of a year. And then we'll look at a specific implementation of assessment for summative purposes through our gauntlet of riddles assignment. Um, and that gauntlet of riddles uh, is uh, has sort of been scoped out in its entirety. We sort of set the task, we explain what the requirement's going to be, uh, the types of things we're looking for, and then the assessment rubric that we'd be using to assess that. And we'll look specifically at the types of things that we're aiming for um, out of that, that task. So it really is a kind of plug and play, drop in your classroom, ready to go. Um, but we'll run through a few of the, the bits and pieces that you need to be aware of before you can use it effectively. So we have an assumption that we've sort of designed into this because obviously you can't really design an assessment from zero knowledge. There is some kind of prerequisite or pre-learning that does take place from students before that. So the assumptions we're making about the Gauntlet of Riddles activity are that students will have completed a digital technologies challenge, one of our ACADT challenges before, and ideally that would be one of the funds, fun one of the challenges that includes functions. So the fun the challenges that we've kind of used as the basis of that are our digital technologies chatbot challenge. Um, no functions in that one, but it is sort of the basis of the interaction that we want to observe in this particular assignment. Uh, also the data representation challenge, which does touch on functions, but also covers some of the binary um, that we want to include in the final activity, uh, or the cyber challenge cryptography, 
and the cyber challenge um, does cover functions and does look at binary and does cover most of the programming concepts that we want to, to be exploring in this particular activity as well. So there are other ways that you could do it. We're not saying you must do a DT challenge in advance, but they are ready to go. Uh, if you're teaching programming with functions in your classroom through some other mechanism, then you know, you're going to be covering that prerequisite knowledge that's gonna be required for students to be able to achieve a, a passing grade in, in this particular task. Now, the other thing that we're going to be assuming is that students will have been guided through Escape the Dungeon, which is a, an ACA design task as well. And the main reason for that is it's going to cover a lot of the sort of um, general code structure that is going to inform the design of their solution for uh, the, the Gauntlet of Riddles activity. But it's also going to include some activities that students would be using to build up their, their capabilities in algorithm design, and in, in programming, translating algorithms into programming. And so the idea here would be to look at a rubric you could use to cover or to assess the algorithms component that is being completed through that, uh, that guided activity in Escape the Dungeon, so that the focus of the Gauntlet of Riddles is really on that programming and implementation aspect. So one of the things I guess we really wanna emphasize is that trying to assess too much in one task is going to make that task very unwieldy. It's gonna put students in a situation where having to um, sort of complete that task and, and failing in one aspect of it or getting something wrong that is critical to that task can, be, can really penalize their, their sort of grade for the year. So one of the things that we really wanna emphasize here is basically um, spread your assessment out, look for many opportunities to assess these things, and you can actually consider how the same ideas or concepts inside a rubric can be applied to um, different tasks with some minor adjustments. So uh, the rubrics we've designed here, uh, we're gonna give you an example of a sort of general rubric, which is used for the uh, Escape the Dungeon activity, and then a task specific rubric. I've seen a couple of questions in the chat about the year levels we're focusing on. This task is written specifically for year seven and eight, but as Owen has said in the chat, we could definitely adapt this quite easily for a year nine, 10 level activity as well. So starting with Escape the Dungeon, um, which is our accessible guided classroom activity, what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna dive into the task itself and we're going to have a look at what this task entails. So 150% zoom should give you a nice good look at this. Um, essentially where we're coming from with this is we want students to write some Python code that explores the flow that would be typical of a player moving through a dungeon in an interactive text-based game. So uh, if you played early games such as Zork, uh, but there are a whole number of other multi-user dungeons that exist online that um, many people sort of interacted with for many, many years. Early games on platforms like the Apple II, Apple II um, and the Amiga and things like that did have a lot of these elements in it, often with some kind of graphics as well, but we're just focusing on those text interactions to keep it relatively simple. Um, all the interaction, therefore, is through keyboard commands. And so what students will be doing is building a game up that uses the control structures that they'll have developed their, their knowledge in through the DT challenges, like if statements and loops and things like that, um, to, to build a dungeon escape game. So yeah, um, these sort of RPG type text games, which I see Anthony's mentioned in the chat, are fairly common for sort of introductory programming type activities. Uh, they're generally pretty engaging because you can sort of skin them with any topic that students might be excited about, but there's enough going on in terms of complexity for students to be able to demonstrate um, quite a lot of programming capability in terms of both tracking program state as well as understanding how movement or flow through a program is going to be reflected, not just in the code, but in the input and output that a player observes when, when playing the game. So. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how we build up the dungeon, Owen? Yep, uh, sure. So we, we built the dungeon by um, taking this concept of uh, a multi-user, uh, just a, a dungeon game where we can um, build a very simple interactivity to begin with. And so um, when, it, when we just get started, this flow chart just describes um, two rooms and the only thing that a user can do is move between the the two rooms. And so um, we start in a room, we have an action, we can move forward, 
to go to a middle room and the only action possible is to go back to the um, beginner room. Um, and so this can describe um, for students how they can create code to simulate this dungeon and what that code structure actually looks like, as well as providing them with some simple commands to get started. Um, so this is the code that does exactly that. Um, we have an if statement, which is um, depending on which room we're in, we just keep track of that within a room variable. And everything under that is just the code that is inside um, this room. And so students can um, just download this code and run it. And um, uh, this is what is part of that um, specific tasks. Um, we also have some guiding questions to test the students' um, understanding of, of this particular task. Um, so some questions might be um, that if you have the answers for these, please um, put them in the chat. Um, what's the purpose of the while true loop? How the program keeps track of where we are in the game? And how does um, the program decide which message to display? So which line numbers are responsible? Um, um, so to answer for question two, the, the program keeps track of where we are using this room variable. Um, and as we go through the loop, we just um, check that. And when we want to move rooms, we just reassign. Um, so we do an if statement and reassign what the room variable is using this if statement on level eight and nine. Um, and the purpose of, does anyone know why we have the while the infinite loop here? If anyone wants to answer in the chat? And while you're typing in the chat, I think it's probably worth just pointing out that one of the things we wanted to model with this task is that there's an expectation in the year seven and eight uh, content descriptions of the Australian curriculum that students understand how to modify code. So we didn't want to start this particular task with a blank slate. We wanted to give students an algorithm, the associated code, so that you could spend time in class if you needed to drawing the similarities between those, how the code reflects what's occurring in the algorithm, um, how you would think about the problem from an algorithmic perspective so you could then implement it. And that's the idea of these guiding questions that we've established here. The whole yeah. point is to make sure that students are thinking about the algorithms they see in the code that they write. Yeah, and so the, the reason for the loop is so you can move back and forth between the rooms. If you just wanted to have one room, then another room, you could go forward in one direction, but you couldn't go back the other way. And so that's the, that's the reason for having, uh, having the loop there. Um, we, we wanted our final assessment task to focus on extensibility, which means, um, and so basically what we've done in step two is have exactly the same functionality, but separate that into subprocessors. So here, this is our main loop, I guess in our flowchart. Just check which room we're in. If we're in the start, we go to the start room. If we're in the middle, go to the middle room. And we've broken up those into those subprocesses into their own little flowcharts. Um, so this can this is how you make your flowcharts, uh, your algorithms um, represent more and more complicated um, complicated algorithms just through through the one flowchart. And so you can break it up um, in the start room. Um, it has the exactly the same functionality, but we just broke it up into functions. And we did exactly the same thing with the uh, associative code. The function of what happens is exactly the same, but we're showing students how to make their programs a bit more extensible by breaking up the code into, into functions. And so down the bottom here, this is where the, uh, the main loop is. This is the main thing that happens in our program. And um, we have the functionality of the start room and the middle room um, shown below. Um, okay, so Bruce, what, um, what do we wanna talk about next? Well, the questions here are really emphasizing to students in this particular case, some of the specifics of Python. So the way that you um, would, would sort of frame a question like this might be dependent on your programming language. But in Python, because we need to make sure that our functions are defined before they are called, uh, the whole point of number the question four is to get students to actually start manipulating the code that's been provided. So 
if students were to pick up this code in their, um, their version that is actually executable, and it can't be executed here in the document, but we can actually just talk about what's going on here. Um, if we pick up this code and we were to place it in front, say here, and execute the code in this order instead, we would have an errors thrown. And like Anthony said in the chat, we get an issue about the function not being defined, which in, in Python would be called a name error. And that's because the, the program gets to this line, tries to execute start room, but because start room doesn't exa exist, it fails. Uh, because, because the program just doesn't exactly know what it needs to do because it's never seen this combination of start room before. And so we intentionally want students to run this code with that um, in the wrong place so that they see errors, so that they understand that errors are things that are just expected when you're writing, writing programs. I mean, there's this real sort of aversion to any kind of uh, making a mistake that we have sort of encouraged in students as a result of how school operates. We really want to say to students, there's no harm in trying things out, getting things wrong, and thinking about what the cause of that particular problem is. So we want them to run the error, see the error, and then explain what that error means. We also then want to sort of review what we may have covered in functions in previous um, activities that we've done. So we look specifically at what the return statements do and how they're used. And so here we want students to identify that the return function on this room is being returned to the main program. And then because if the function gets to this point and returns middle from middle room, what will happen is this will be assigned the value middle, that will overwrite the value in the room variable, and then the function will repeat, uh, the program will repeat itself again for the while true loop. So you can see that what we're trying to do through this series of activities is to actually familiarize students with the code in a sort of deep way. We don't want them sort of just copying and pasting or doing a series of small activities that don't have them engaging with the same code base in a meaningful way. We want them exploring different ways that you can solve these problems. And we want to build up, as Owen said, this extensible version of the code. So step three then, it starts to increase the functionality. Step Moving from step one to step two was refactoring, was changing the code so that it was easy to manage and edit down the track. Step three is starting to add new features. So we wanted to add a look function to both rooms. This allows us to sort of see what the state of each room is independently of the others. And so now the main thing that we would expect students to identify and that we would probably talk through with them in this particular case is the inclusion of this look action in the flowchart. If we compare this start room here with the look, with the start room in our previous thing, our previous part, there was only forward was the only action. There was an else which did nothing, but forward was the only action a player could take. Now they've got a forward action, they've got a look action, and if they look, the result is different. We need to display some kind of message to the player saying, you know, it is a dusty room. Um, and so this time we're at a point where we want students to start writing their code themselves. We've given them co the code and the algorithm for question one and question two. In question three, we've given them the algorithm, but we're expecting them now to be able to translate that algorithm into code. So we refactor the code slightly, this time adding this new state dictionary to manage the state. Um, and to giving them code that has essentially been updated to just make use of this dictionary rather than use the, the functions that we used before. But in all other respects, it's exactly the same as the previous code. And so what we've said to students now is this code works, it runs, you can move between the two rooms just like we could before. But the feature that's currently missing in this code is the ability to look in the room. And so the questions here are simply to update your program so that it behaves like the flowchart. And one of the things that we've done for you in this particular task is we've provided all of the answers below. So we can see here um, the answer to this particular question with our if statement that checks for looking as well as setting an action. So you've got both things um, now present in the start room. We also update the middle room to also include um, a look but if you look and there's a locked door as well and you need it to, to be preventing the user from exiting out the door, 
then you want some kind of feedback that is provided to the user when they attempt to exit as well. So the additional actions that we have to add to the middle room are both move forward to attempt to exit the door, move backward to go back to the start and to look to spot a key on the floor. So remember, this is still guided. If you're doing this in your classroom and you're working with students that haven't got a whole lot of experience, there is nothing wrong whilst working through this task um, to assist students and provide them with the support they need to get over the line. Because this is all still preparatory work for the summative task, which we're going to look at in the next part of the webinar. So in step four, the final step, um, we wanna get them picking up keys so that they can open the door and they can exit the dungeon. So really basic functionality, but this time we're, we're not even providing the flow chart. Instead, we're specifying exactly what the requirements are. And the first thing students need to do is design the flow chart, uh, test their flow chart, and then write the code to implement the new algorithm so that they've got a complete working program at the end. And this is where I'm going to stop briefly in terms of explaining the task. And we're going to look at some of the assessment principles that we've incorporated because um, like I was saying before, there is scope in this task to assess or to, to look at how you can start assessing students' understanding of algorithms before we even dive into our final programming task. So we've got this rubric that we've put together also available and we'll send you the links to all of this, this at the end of the webinar. Um, but this particular rubric is assessing algorithms according to the year seven and eight expectations in the Australian curriculum. Now, these are all based on the unpacking elements that the ACA have published uh, on the Unpacking the Curriculum website, and we'll look at that in a minute. But essentially, uh, for students to demonstrate that they are able to uh, understand algorithms as far as the uh, curriculum is concerned, they need to understand representation, they need to understand how to design and modify algorithms, they need to understand how control structures feed into algorithm design, and they should be able to demonstrate both tracing and testing of algorithms. And so if you haven't seen it before, the ACA website, which has an unpack the curriculum section, which you can see in the top navigation bar there, has um, a breakdown of the curriculum according to key concepts. Key concepts generally map to one of the content descriptions, um, but we've got this great page for the whole of you seven and eight, which you can click on to unpack and it will show you the expectations against each of the key concepts. And what we've done at the ACA is we've brought together myself as one of the writers with James, our um, director, who is also one of the writers of the curriculum. And we've also pulled in Anna Kaname and Paul Christofferson, the, um, the other two writers of the Australian curriculum. And what we've done is we've gone back over each of the content descriptions and we've broken them down into the individual components that we see being fundamental to students being able to demonstrate their understanding of um, the expectation of the curriculum sets in each band level. So you can see that as far as the following of algorithms is concerned, we want them to be able to represent and trace their algorithms, select an appropriate representation, an appropriate representation for the task at hand, and then follow that through. Uh, in terms of design, it's not just coming up with their own, but modifying exactly their existing algorithms, which is why we've designed the task that you've seen in the way that we have. Test them by moving through them, and then uh, we go through the expectations in terms of the control structures that should be present in the algorithms to manage program flow. So we have a sample answer for this particular part. So we've got this step here where we want the program to be extended so that the key works. Now, we had an algorithm before that allowed us to look in the dungeon for a key and move between two rooms, but that was it. Now, Owen, do you wanna talk about your example, your answer to this particular? Yep. Okay, so we'll scroll down to my solution. So uh, the functionality that's required is we want to be able to uh, look um, for a key and then once we've spotted a key, we should be able to pick up the key and then we should be able to use the key to exit the dungeon and, and finish the game. Um, so with the, our main loop again, we've got our start, middle and exit, depending on what this room variable is. So I've added an exit um, room to be extensible. Um, the start room's exactly the same. Now we've got our look message and 
the middle room now has uh, some more actions. It has the look action, it has the pickup action, and then with the forward action, it checks if we've, if we've got the key or not, and if we do, we can go to exit by setting the next room to be exit, or with no, just print the door, door is locked. And if we um, print exits, then we just go view in. And um, if we get to this exit room, we'll end the algorithm up, up, up there. And so what we actually wanted to do is we wanted to show you our rubric with this particular task. And we're going to try and mark this, um, this implementation um, based on each of, each of these things. Um, so I think we're gonna do the annotation tools and um, I get the, and in order to do that, you go um, view options and annotate. Um, and I think we want you to give, give a stamp which, which um, band um, this, this, um, this algorithm should, should fit into. Um, and so we'll just do that as, a, as, an, as an activity. Um, so it it pretty much does all of the functionality, but we just want to give it give it a mark to see see what you all think of what this um this example should be based on this rubric. Um, so if you want to click on the Zoom window, view options, and then annotate, then click uh, select a stamp and select a tick or whatever you like, and then you can stamp on the on Bruce's yep. View options and annotate. You can see there. Has anyone got a stamp yet? So yep. Yeah, okay, we're seeing seeing some stamps wow. on the screen. Okay, good. Um, you just want to stamp anywhere randomly at this stage to show yeah. us what your stamp so, is working. Yeah. There's more than uh, there's more than two of us here, so we want to see a few more stamps than just. Uh, and I know one of them is mine. All right, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Okay, excellent. Uh, I'll clear them all now, great. And so let's go back to the assessing algorithms. So for this representing an algorithm, we're talking about an algorithm representation kind of uh, talks about our flowchart. Um, so an appropriate representation could be the flowchart. Um, it could, they, there might be other types of representations that we can use like pseudocode. Um, so this is why the language is quite broad. Um, Execute your um, and so we'll mark this one. So put a stamp um, on our algorithm if you can see that mostly on the left there um, to see what what that looks like. And we could have given everyone the download link for this, Bruce, but that's that's okay. Um, does anyone have any guesses? You're gonna for this represent algorithms. You're gonna give it A, B, C, D, or an E. Any so ideas? Just put your stamp in the relevant box in the... Is that you clicking E at Owen? Yeah, yes. <laughs> so we're just looking at the represent algorithms line at the moment, but if you want to start putting um, stamps on the other rows as well, if you want, you can. So we've got a couple of these. And, and here, we really do want you to, to give it a go. Um, if you, Jason says that you haven't been able to find the stamp, if you go up to the top of your Zoom window, you should have an option up there to um, add annotations. So, um, annotations, once you've got annotations, there's mouse, text, drawer, and stamp. Yeah, and you can choose any of those stamps. It doesn't matter which one um, you want. So, I'm seeing, so, so, oh, it looks like you're doing okay. I've got some B's and some C's. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, we've got a question mark stamp down the bottom there, but that's a new okay. stamp, so that's okay. That person can put questions okay. in the line. Well, they can be unsure. Okay, so can anyone answer why they... Um, the view options are grayed out. All right, sorry about that, Ellie. Um, into that while you talk. Does anyone want to answer why they gave it a B in the represent algorithms and not the A? Why am I only worth a B, in other words? Uh, any ideas? So while people are, are typing in the chat, I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the parts of that rubric. So 
The first thing about whether or not the representation is appropriate here, because we're looking at how we move through um, a dungeon and therefore we're moving between different sort of steps and processes and states in, in a program, uh, a flowchart is an appropriate representation. I mean, a pseudo, a pseudo code would also be appropriate, uh, but if you compare it, if you if you consider something like a decision tree, then we'd, that would be an inappropriate representation here. So um, in this particular case, it's pretty clear that it's an appropriate representation. In terms of executing the algorithm uh, correctly here, what we mean by that is that the student has used all of the relevant symbols that they need to use to be able to construct this representation accurately. So. You can imagine if a flowchart didn't actually have arrowheads on the lines, if it was just lines joining boxes together, uh, it's unclear as to what the transition between each state would look like. So in that particular case, we would say that the execution of this representation isn't correct. Um, and here, the sub processes are definitely there. The question becomes whether or not the relationship between those sub processes and the main um, program are present. So I see a comment there in the thread about whether um, we need to play or see the, play the game. Here though, we're just assessing the, um, the, the flowchart. So uh, if we look here, the relationship between the main program and the sub programs is sort of captured in our statements here. Go to the start room, you go to the start room, you begin that, you get to the end, you continue main, that sends you back to this point and you can repeat this process. So the relationship is quite clear based on the language that's selected and the use of, you know, uh, these sort of statements that will link each of the individual functions back to the main, uh, the main program's flowchart. So I would probably say that this is an A uh, based on that. Um, in terms of B or C, um, look, you could argue there's a case for B there, but it would all come down to how you taught your flowcharts in, um, when you taught your students initially. Now, um, Trisha, look and pick up a not connected but need to be in the gameplay. Um, you will see when it comes to the code, we get more specific about exactly what that looks like. But it, we would argue that if you don't look for the key, then you can't pick up the key. And the question about whether or not these should appear at this stage in the flowchart is actually captured in one of our later assessment criteria. So. When we're looking at this particular uh, rubric, we're looking at each of these independently. So focusing on representation as opposed to design um, or the control structures that are used. When we look further down the rubric, and I know you don't have all of the rubric in front of you, so it's hard to see the whole lot at once. Um, what we've tried to do for the purposes of clarity is make sure that no, nothing gets assessed twice. Otherwise, you're disadvantaging the student if they get one of the things that happens to appear in multiple criteria um, because they're going to get penalized for it twice. In this particular case, you can only get penalized for missing something once. So as far as look and pick up are concerned, you can see that those actually get captured in, was it control structures? No, it's in this one, in, in B, it's this second one here, in design and modify because if we follow this um, algorithm through, and this is actually captured in one of the tests that Owen has put in the, um, in the, in the assessment task and the task itself, if we go up to the task itself. I make that full screen, Bruce. Yeah. Will. If we go up to the task here, um, we've got this test. The user picks up the key without looking for it first. Now, if we look at the algorithm, the flowchart that's been developed here, the user can simply go into the middle room and pick up the key. And this algorithm would set that to true. You could continue the program then and you would have the key and would be able to exit the dungeon. And that's not what we want. We want the person to actually have to look for the key before they pick it up. So a more correct version of this implementation would actually prevent pickup from being a viable action until the person had looked first. So you'd have a similar kind of has key decision You'd have a has looked decision that would need to be deter checked to determine whether or not pickup was a valid action. And this flowchart doesn't have that. So on that basis, you could definitely start to look for penalizing marks because there are steps that are not that there are necessary steps in the correct implementation that are missing. Um, 
you'll also see that that's captured in tracing, where we actually find that the expected output diverges from what is intended with that result. So we're not really going to have enough time in the short hour that we've got to go into a, this in a lot more detail. But what we would suggest you do is you take a look at these resources and you, you, you can get in touch with us with any questions or concerns you have that you look at potentially using these in your classroom, trying them out with your students, looking at the modifications and changes you would make to make them more accessible to your kids, uh, and then feed that information back to us. Uh, Owen and I are still tweaking the rubric. There's some more work that we need to do on it between now and sort of a finished published version, but we are absolutely committed to having the published version ready to go for next term. So what you're seeing is a, a sort of a late stage beta preview and you can grab it as is now if you want to experiment or work with it on your own, which we'll, we'll show you links later in this webinar, but we will be releasing a final version ready for term three. Yeah. Uh, so Bruce, if you want to go back to the slide deck. Yeah. Um, so what we've talked about so far is the pre-work and this is how you can assess uh, assessment in your tasks. And what the students would do would be go through that activity, design their own flowchart for the final version and put it in their uh, workbook. And then you could apply the rubric that we've created to assess each student's um, algorithms um, as part of digital technologies. And then after you've done um, algorithms, you also want to assess their programming ability. And this task previously um, builds up all of the features need, needed to do this gauntlet of riddles programming assignment. Um, and so, are we, uh, all right. Um, so you can actually download all of, that, all of these documents here by going to this URL, if you want to get all of these documents. Um, it's a OneDrive live folder, which does have the code there that you, can, um, that you can run yourself. And it does have a code breakdown of all the different, different versions in, inside, um, in, inside that short link. And I'll leave, leave that up there um, for a minute if you want to go and get those now. Um, but the Gauntlet of Riddles task is a similar type of game to the uh, Escape the Dungeon except it extends, it extends upon that in, in, in several ways. Um, now we have made sure that link is a OneDrive link. So teachers in Queensland will be able to access that without any, any difficulty whatsoever, we hope. If that's not the case, please let us know and we'll make sure that's sorted out. But yeah. regardless of where you are, you should be able to follow that link and download all of yeah. it. I'll type the link in the chat if you, if you want to get it now. And then uh, Bruce can um, start talking. So the gauntlet of riddles task is our summative task. This is, this is what we'd expect students to be able to produce if they have done all of the necessary programming required for U7 and 8. So we provide some context by talking about how chatbots work, um, how they essentially respond to user interaction and track exactly what it is that um, the state of that particular interaction or conversation and we talk a little bit about how puzzle games will generally rely on this kind of um, sort of back and forth between a user and a computer to be able to solve problems. So what we've decided to do here is design a task that every student should be able to achieve some degree of success with. And to do that, we've actually made sure that the specification um, that, that we use is going to demonstrate all of what we need to be able to demonstrate. So we're going to show you a working version of, the, of this gauntlet, which I'm going to, to open up on a separate window while we do. Um, as I do, Owen will give you a bit of a run through about the um, base game and how that works. Um, yep. I open the code. Cool. Um, so um, we've specified the levels and basically um, we're asking the students to um, program their own chatbot. Um, and we've provided the specification for what each of those levels look like. So we're not assessing creativity and we're showing an, an example of what um, an example could look like so they don't have to come up with their own. But what we are assessing is their ability to produce that output and test it appropriately. Um, so we've designed a game that has um, a series of levels. I think there's seven levels plus an introduction. Um, and we show an example output of what that looks like as part of the assessment task. 
Um, and the code that you can run to do this task is in that link um, that's in the chat. Um, and Bruce is going to pull that up um, soon. Um, but each of the, um, yeah. All right. And, and in, the, in the code, you can see in, in Bruce's window, we have uh, an A example of what we would expect uh, a really strong student to be able to produce after doing all of the prerequisite material. And we also have a C example that um, does all of the base functionality correctly, but um, doesn't include any of the extension um, stuff. So we've got examples at different levels that you can, that you can see um, if you wanted to, to, uh, to run this task. So Bruce is going to run it and um, you can see the output below. Um, so we can type Bruce's name um, and the first riddle which is provided to the students is be silent to continue. He types in something, tells him to shut up and then um, once he hits nothing and he's silenced, then he can pass. And so it's very much like the Monty Python, um, um, Monty Python kind of uh, answer the three questions to get through kind of activity. Um, so and the guardian speak my name to pass, and then it provides an additional hint. And then if Bruce types um, my name and passes the riddle, then he's successful and uh, continues to the next level. And so we've specified what each of the levels need to be and provided example, examples in the, in the solution. Um, so this is what an example solution would, would look like. Um, and so uh, the, next, the next level is getting output um, based on, um, getting information based on the previous questions, um, testing case. So if we have, um, if we're shouting the answer, we have to type it in all, all caps. And as we go through, we make the level slightly more complicated and assess different types of um, uh, programming elements that we expect students to be able to complete. Um, so one does if they can handle case correctly, another if it um, uh, takes in information from previously, so it uses the user's name, so it must pass the variable in so that it can check against that correctly. Um, so for example, if Bruce gets up to level four in the game, um, 23, and he shouts the answer, and then knock, knock, who's there? Um, you, he has to type whatever name he used previously in order to pass, and he typed in Bruce. And so when he types in Bruce, he can pass again. Um, and so we make the levels uh, more and more complicated as we build up the game. Um, and so in, in the level five, we have to say something three times in a row um, and have different programming constructs here that, um, that the students demonstrate um, in order to pass through all of the levels. Um, I guess one of the things we want to really emphasize here is that setting a task that basically says to students, write an if statement with three options, is not really providing them with any side of kind of context in which to understand why that is a useful thing for them to be able to do. So the goal here was to make sure that the way that the requirements of each question or each level in this particular case are specified, force them to implement increasingly complicated control structures and, and, and aspects of their program. So the comparisons naturally get harder. You can't solve this question without first being able to sort of um, store and then process the, the data that gets input or output by the user or the computer in another, in another question or in another statement, another, another step of the interaction between them. Now, yep. it's a great opportunity as well to uh, cover different parts of the curriculum. So in year seven, eight in the data representation and year seven, eight specifically mentions binary representations and text representation as numbers. So you can include that as well by using emojis in your program. So here in this example, um, we specify the binary output of that emoji character. And if they copy and paste that into the CHR function or chur function in Python, then it will give them that emoji. Um, and so it's a great way to link different parts of the curriculum as just and include that as one of the levels and assess their understanding of 
that aspect of the curriculum as well. And as, Owen, as Owen said, we didn't want students getting stuck on you know, designing an interesting problem or a riddle, right? We wanted to make sure that at the very least, if a student goes through and uses all of the riddles that we've written here in the requirements, um, they can still demonstrate all of the programming skills that are necessary for us to be able to be confident that they can write code. Uh, if they want to vary from here, if they want to design their own uh, riddles, and, and, and then, then they're, they're more than, it's, it's, it's great if they do that. Uh, and we encourage them to do that through, particularly the strong students, through an extension activity. So we'll talk a little bit about the DLC in a minute, but one of the other things that we really want to emphasize for students is the importance of testing code. So we want them to know that testing is an important part of the process, that we are very much interested in seeing exactly how their code runs, not just in terms of the final product, but for them to demonstrate the, the progress that they've made as they move from the, the beginning right through to the end and their final completion. And so we want them to actually show us the input and output they, they, they have when they do their testing. So what we'd be expecting here is quite literally for them to have run the game and played it just like I have. And when they get to the end of the, this question, they would simply copy that, paste it into a document. So if this was a new document, for example, they could simply paste it in and they would simply say, you know, test one, level one or something like that. And then they would introduce all of the tests that they've done over the series of their, their, their program and their development. And they can give us a very clear indication then of the tests they run, the, and you can get a sense of how extensive they were. You can, you can get a sense of when mistakes were made and how they corrected them. And it really does sort of emphasize the value of running that code and developing it gradually. So uh, we didn't want to make it too onerous for a student to do that testing. And that's why being able to copy and paste the results of those tests out and submit them is a perfectly valid way of asking students to demonstrate the testing that they do as they're developing their project. Yeah, um, so we also have extension tasks um, because, and they, these can get quite hard and we want them to be quite hard because we don't actually think that all students should be able to get an A. Uh, we want to give them some opportunities to show that they've um, exceeded the band level uh, expectations of the curriculum and can um, uh, give them opportunities to show them that they understand, um, show, show their understanding. And so we add um, a scoring element into the extra game. And so you can uh, keep track of the score um, plus one for an a correct answer, minus one for an incorrect answer. A a incorrect answer is an example of scoring and showing the percentages of where they're up to. Um, and additionally, we have um, additional commands that they can implement at any time in the game um, as well. So if they wanted to use the dictionary like we did in the previous task to also implement the commands, then that should be possible. Um, but it's, it's, it's not uh, trivial for students to do that. And so it's, it is a good opportunity for their strongest students to show their extension, um, show, show what, they've, what they can do. Um, um, and yeah. And so in the rubric for this particular task that we've completed for you, and if you do have suggestions or you would like to run this task um, with your students, then um, please do and let us know how it goes. You, all of these documents are in, uh, in the link in the chat. Um, this is what the rubric um, specifically uh, looks like. Um, and there's a few ways that you can do this task. So we've got the rubric here as a document, and we also have um, loaded this assessment task into a module inside Grok Learning. And Grok have a new, um, uh, a new uh, feature that is gonna be um, released soon that includes uh, including assessment rubrics in, uh, inside, the, inside the programming platform. So here I've created the base game um, that um, you can see exactly the same rubric um, as before. It's, it's essentially the uh, copy paste of the um, assessment task. It has the uh, extension and also has the uh, gauntlet of riddles where students can write their code in here. They can add um, additional files if they wanted to make their uh, program split 
across multiple files, and then they can um, mark and, and submit their um, assignments um, inside inside Grok. And inside the assessment tab, it will be available for teachers soon. And when it is, um, we're going to release this course publicly. Um, you can mark students against the assessment and uh, assign them a mark um, inside, uh, apply the rubric here. Um, the advantage of doing it within Grok is that you could get students to submit uh, their solutions here and then access all of the student solutions um, within the teacher dashboard if you're using Grok uh, already. Um, the one disadvantage that does exist currently is that you could not get students to also submit their test cases um, as a separate document. You, you need them to get to them to submit that um, separately. Um, but we, uh, for next term, uh, we will release this as an assessment course that you can use this task um, inside the coding platform. Now, the intention, of course, will be to make sure that answers are available to teachers inside the teaching notes. So you can see that we've already done that as well, including a C example, and we'll also have downloads to the A example so that you've got those built in. Yeah, you already have those already if you've gone to that uh, link in the chat as well. Yeah. Students will also be able to use the assessment uh, tab to uh, self-assess to basically indicate where they think their, their assignment sits against each of the criteria, which is a really valuable st uh, step in the, in the assessment process because it forces them to reflect on their learning that takes place over the course of completing the task. Um, and so, you know, all of these features are things that we're working very closely with the Brock team to, 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 to actually bring to schools and to teachers uh, as part of the DT Challenges project. So uh, you, you'll be able to sort of simply dive in and it does save you from having to go through the process of setting up their own, uh, setting up a Python environment on student computers, whether that's in your lab or on their own computers, if that's a restriction that you have, uh, because they can literally write the code that would just copy and paste straight out into their own environment as well. So uh, we see this as a, as a nice uh, value add for teachers that are already using the platform. For teachers that aren't using the platform because they've been a little bit hesitant to be due to the, to the lack of assessment options, we wanna show you what's possible through assessment inside the platform because this, like I said, was all, all gonna be sort of part of what we provide through, through the existing DT Challenges project. Um, and that's a good point, actually, Anthony. Um, Anthony's pointed out in the chat that Outlook doesn't like Python code, um, essentially because Python scripts can run malicious things. Uh, you'll find that most mail clients and online services will strip uh, Python files from, from attachments that you send. So because of that, um, submitting code can be a complicated thing for schools to manage if your learning management system's not built for it. So being able to, to do all of your submission through the web on an existing code platform could be a significant advantage. Yeah, yeah, excellent point, Anthony. So, we shared this link before and we'll include the link and additional information uh, with the mail out that comes out with the, um, the post, the uh, post this webinar, webinar stuff, stuff. The, yep. to the webinar. But one of the other things that we'll be doing very, very soon as well is releasing resources like this one uh, through our assessment tasks section that is coming soon to the resources page. So right now, the assessment tasks section doesn't exist. This is a sneak preview of what's coming. Uh, the gauntlet of riddles, as you can see, will include the curriculum mapping using the same um, mapping technology that we use for all of the resources we have on the ACA website. The All at Sea task is currently being presented in the webinar that's running parallel to this one uh, by Sajatha and Nicola, our colleagues at the ACA. So that's a primary level task for year five and six, and that will also be available. And that will include the same kinds of things as what we've talked about here today. Um, and we expect that will be ready and released sometime over the next couple of weeks, ready for term three. I think it's really important to just re-emphasize before we finish up that um, you don't need to assess the whole curriculum. So you'll see that we haven't tried to put too much into these tasks. They focus on very specific things. Realistically, the time that a student would need to be able to complete the um, uh, uh, Gauntlet of Riddles task, if they've done the programming before, would actually give them, uh, you probably would only need a couple of weeks 
to like maybe maybe three to four hours of class time plus a little bit of extension, uh, a little bit of extra home time to construct that assignment. We provide them with the structure, they've seen examples, we've given them the riddles that they can use. So even for the students that would struggle with the sort of design of a task like that, the fact that so much is already pre-existing that they can use so that they can focus on the development of the logic and get their program flow right means that you know you really can just focus on the programming aspects you don't need to worry about the ideation and the other design thinking aspects um, if they do it that's great you can incorporate it into your extension criteria and into sort of your differentiation factors for students at the top of the uh, group but ultimately by breaking the task, uh, breaking the expectations of assessment up across a number of tasks, you can continue to revisit these things gradually over time, and you can get a more sort of holistic view of how a student develops, both in a formative sense, as well as um, capture summative data for the purposes of reporting against uh, outcomes for uh, end of semester or end of year assessment expectations. Yeah, and it's important to note that the weightings in the rubric have been quite carefully designed to give the opportunities for struggling students still enough marks that they don't feel completely discouraged. Um, so we did spend quite a lot of time crafting the rubric um, as an example that hopefully uh, you can all use to, um, uh, to see. So for example, um, if you scroll to the top, Bruce, um, we made the task out of 100, but um, the E standard has zero to 40, um, and there's quite a lot of scope to give lots of gimme marks to students that are struggling throughout, uh, throughout, the, throughout this rubric. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And any feedback that you have on the resources that we're producing, for example, the rubrics, the assessment tasks, um, that would be absolutely great to hear. Um, and, if you do want to give this task uh, a go in your classrooms, then um, please, please let us know how it goes as well. All right, so that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I know Owen and I are happy to sit here for another couple of minutes if people have specific questions in the chat or when we finish recording, if you want to turn your mic or video on and ask us additional questions, that'll be okay for a few minutes too. This is the last webinar for the term. So New South Wales and a number of other states are on holidays next week. And so we've got a two week break in terms of the delivery of the webinar series, but we are coming back in term three with more webinars and they will continue to take place on Mondays between four and 5 p.m. And that comp.ac slash webinars link that you see on the screen there will remain active and we'll take you to our webinars slash events page where we'll make sure that uh, links to all of the future webinars are going to be present and available for you if you want to continue to register and come along to future ones. So uh, thank you for your attendance this evening. It's been great to have uh, many of you get in here and interact with us and to, to throw suggestions and comments into the chat. Um, I'm going to end the recording now. Uh, Owen, just a... Yeah. You. Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah, if you do have any uh, more questions, please um, please feel free to ask us in the chat, and we're happy to answer anything that you guys might ask about assessment or about digital technologies um, more broadly. Um, thanks, thanks a lot.